Hi, so I'm Charlene, and I've been with McKenzie for a very long time. So I might have seen some of you in and out of the hospital. Um, but Louise asked me to speak tonight on portion control. And in America, we tend to supersize things, as you know, fast food, now big portions, and that's what people gravitate towards. But in all actuality, and even back in the 60s and 70s, servings were smaller, plates were smaller, and I have distributed through the room, and you're welcome to pick them up and feel them and you know pass them around, <laughs> but this is what a plate should look like. So back in the 60s, probably when a lot of you were growing up, <clears throat> it was about an eight or nine inch plate. Now if you have Corel type at home, this would be like the dessert plate, and then they have the bigger corral, which people use as their dinner plate. You should be eating off of this and using the other one as a platter. This is uh, similar to the larger corral at home. This is an 11, sometimes it goes to 12. This is 11, this is um, eight, nine inches, what they recommend. They also recommend, uh, the American Diabetes Association and the American um, Dietetic Association also recommend you serve restaurant style and not family style. Meaning that you don't put the bowls on the table and then have, because then you tend to have more and more, and then you lose track of really how much you ate. Whereas if you pre-portion like a restaurant service and pre-plate your food, then you can um, account for actually how much you've eaten. If you're still hungry after you eat a meal like this, this is well portioned. This is based on all these pieces of meat that down there, that's a fish patty with spinach and baked beans as your starch. Your starch. In the middle, it's meatloaf, three ounces with a half a cup of green beans and a half a cup of hash browns. This one is a half a cup of rice and three ounces of roast beef, which are sliced thin, as you can see, and a half a cup of carrots. There's one more plate out there. Oh, the ham. That's actually two ounces of ham, but you'll notice it's very thin. Typically a three ounce portion, or that could be a dinner portion as well, with a half a cup of potatoes and a half a cup of cauliflower. And that's what they, they recommend, the American Diabetes Association. So that's a a, a proper portion. If you get hungry after that, I recommend you go right to more vegetables and have a nice, big, beautiful salad on this side. And maybe even eat the salad first. And make it fun to eat the salad so that it's not boring. You know, put like leafy greens, different colors. You could put green peppers, red peppers, yellow peppers, orange peppers. Um, green beans, cut up, cut up um, asparagus if it's in season, you know, get creative, uh, red onions, and so it's colorful and attractive and find a nice low calorie salad dressing that you like and eat as much as you can of that because that's free. The next thing I will go to if you're still hungry is the vegetable group because that's only 25 calories a serving. And then the starch group is about 80 calories a serving and that's where a lot of people have a problem is the starch group because a lot of people don't realize by the way this is also a half a cup serving and the starch group um, just from my books which I didn't have one for everyone but pasta is a third cup serving people don't realize that so if you ate is there a spaghetti there yeah Here's, here's my, and you could pass this around. This is the starch group, but people don't realize that if you eat one cup of spaghetti, that's three servings, and if you happen to be a diabetic on an 1,800 calorie diet, which is pretty standard, 18 to 2,000 is what all the, art, the um, your serving sizes and all your items in the store are based on, you only get five carbohydrates a meal, and that's our goal for healthy lifestyle, uh, 18 to 2,000 calories, roughly. That's three of your five for the whole meal. Keep in mind the pasta sauce that, put, that you put on top is another carbohydrate, so there's four servings right there. And if you have a small piece of garlic bread, and I'm talking small, not, not big, you know, a small piece of garlic bread, there's your five. So you couldn't have fruit, you couldn't have milk, you couldn't have anything else after dinner. 
except for a protein source. I, w I do want to say that most of it, now go, go to this handout if you would. This is a way to judge if you don't have the utensils. This gives you an idea of what a cup, just using your hands, your digits, what a cup would look like. Um, so the first one is a fist. And then an ounce of cheese is the meaty part of your hand. I will show you an ounce of cheese. This is three ounces. Um, actually, one ounce is one. And cheese was meant to be a condiment. It was never meant to be main plate. And you know how you go to people's houses on the holidays or in the summer, you go on a boat, you bring a meat and cheese tray or whatever to the beach. It was meant to be Parmesan cheese sprinkled on top of spaghetti or a little bit of Kojak or Mexican cheese sprinkled on top of a taco. That's what cheese was meant to be because cheese is about nine uh, grams of fat a serving. Low fat food is three grams, a ser three grams a serving size. Medium fat is five grams a serving size and anything more than seven grams of fat a serving is considered a high fat food to be eaten sparingly and on special occasions and relished. Put on some music, light a candle, enjoy it because you're really indulging. So if someone to, were to eat this much cheese, that would be nine, 27 grams of fat. And we recommend no more than three to five servings per item. Uh, typically like a 40 to 50 gram fat diet for the whole day is what we recommend. So that would really be an indulgence. So keep that in mind. Um, a tablespoon is a typical low fat, uh, fat serving like mayo or sour cream or, or cream cheese. If you eat the regular high fat unadulterated, you know, normal sour cream, normal cream cheese, is it this. Three teaspoons equal a tablespoon. So it's your choice of what, to, which one to choose. But again, this tells you what the tip of your finger would be a teaspoon, your thumb would be a tablespoon. By the way, peanut butter. This is a tablespoon of peanut butter. And two of these is equal to a high fat meat. And it's 16 grams of fat. So peanut butter, when you do put it on your bread, it should be sparing. It shouldn't be like um, thick. It should be very sparing. Um, nuts, very interesting. When you eat nuts, pecans, it's four halves of a pecan is a fat serving. Eight almonds, six to eight almonds. And it's typically not those little bags that you buy that you might put in the kids' uh, lunches or that you might find at a 7-Eleven, those little sleeves, that's more like three or four servings. But the industry doesn't tell you that. It's up to you to be, be, be an educated consumer. And then an ounce of meat, I'm sure you've heard that, is about the size of the palm of a woman's hand. This is uh, rather three ounces. This is three ounces of chicken, pure pure meat. If you're going to have the bone, then it would be five ounces. Yell a lot for the bone. And we always recommend that you take off the skin first. Uh, cottage cheese is also a meat item and a quarter cup equals an ounce of meat. This is a quarter cup of cottage cheese, a little guy. So this is for you to, to take home for yourselves and just to give yourselves an idea. Clueless, like if you're at a restaurant or something, you could kind of formulate it in your mind. I'll pick, yeah, let me get, grab your one. Here you go. Um, then on to the next handout would be, I would like to go over this one. When you go out to eat to a restaurant, again, typically they use the larger plate. I've been to some restaurants where they serve you on a platter like I would serve a family meal at home, that's your breakfast, and they load it with carbohydrates so that when you leave the restaurant, you have toast and your home fries and 
then you have your eggs and your bacon, and it, they make it really nice and big so you're full when you leave, but unfortunately you've probably eaten about the size of three breakfasts at one time. So they do recommend you share or ask for a to-go box right off the get-go so that you could put half away. And this goes into detail, really, what you could save yourselves in calories and really what a real portion is. For instance, this pasta platter, this is based on six ounces of chicken with your broccoli and your three cups of linguine. But if you ate half of that, then you'd be getting your three ounces of meat, which is what we recommend, half a cup of broccoli and one and a half cups of pasta, which is still high, but a lot better. And actually one and a half cups is pretty reasonable. There's some on the back. This should be a two-sided, a two-sided. Pizza, by the way, when they talk about two pieces of pizza, they're talking about a small pizza, not a medium or a large pizza. So that's what the two little pieces are based off of, of a small. Same thing with the cookies. If you're ever at the airport or a bakery and they have those mega cookies, that's not, that would be the equivalent of this. You can buy an apple or you can buy an apple. This is an apple, this is a normal, this is a size, this is an appropriate half cup size. If you're eating this, it's at least two, maybe even three servings of carbohydrate. Um, same with a banana. This is a nine inch banana. A uh, serving is half of a nine inch banana. At the hospital, this is unfortunately a poor example, but we buy the petite ones. If I can get them smaller than this, I do, small. So it would be about half this size. And people don't realize they go on diets and they think, oh, I gave up the chips, I gave up the Doritos, I'm not eating chocolate, I'm eating more fruit, I'm eating more bananas. Well, how many bananas do you eat in a day? Well, I eat two bananas and they're so good. Well, that's just four carbohydrates you just ate. Um, people don't realize that you give, you give up this carbohydrate and you eat this, this other one. So the calories are still there. While we're on carbohydrates, I did want to point this out to you. This is a baked potato. That's about the size of a baked potato. So it's, it's not like when you go to Lucky's in Emily City and they fill up your plate with that giant sweet potato or baked potato. Um, a cup of popcorn, if you do get the microwave light, Three cups is a serving, and that might be a good go-to, or if you air pop, three cups. If you get that, that microwave bag, the big bag, it's half a bag, so share it with somebody. You eat half, that's three cups, that's only one carbohydrate, that's, that's okay. When you eat cake, this is a hard one to get used to. It's a two inch by two inch square. I'll even pass this one around. This is what a piece of cake should look like. This is not what you get at the restaurants, this is not what you cut for yourself at home. But this is all the diabetic teachings is based on a dessert this size. I'll let you just pass that around. Ice cream, when they say that ice cream is okay, a half a cup. This is a half a cup of ice cream. This is a serving size. If you have those little old fashioned glass custard cups at home, you know, back from the 60s and 70s, just put a scoop in there or fill that, and when you're done eating, you're done. And just know when you start that that's what you're getting. That's all. Don't eat out of the ice cream container because it's really hard to stop. <laughs> this is a um, this is a peach a, a piece of angel food cake. I just want you to know about the desserts because I know when you go to the restaurants and all, and when you cut them at home, they are a lot larger. And of course, this is a pastry that you get. This is three ounces of pastry. This is very, very hearty. And this would be a big treat. But I know they even come a lot larger than this if you go to um, Jeff's or Walmart. So I'll leave this here. If you're, if you're interested, I'll put that around. I will say that one half cup of a fruit, depending on the density of the food and the way it's absorbed, you could actually have more of the berries and the strawberries, the raspberries, the blueberries, and watermelon come into a, um, a domain where you could actually have a cup of those. When you're talking about cereal, cereal could either be a quarter cup 
which is two tablespoons, is it? A quarter cup? Three of these, two of those, or four, ta four tablespoons, to, two tablespoons to a quarter cup. Granola would be the same carbohydrate or the same serving as one half or rather one cup of like say three quarter cups to a cup of Cheerios. And if you're doing a puff cereal like puff wheat or puff rice, you get a cup and a half. So, but there's no, I call them Jethro Bodine bowls. You know, if you have high school boys or something, they'll grab a serving bowl and fill it with cereal and eat it. They can do it because they're very active. But for sedentary people or people who are not working, um, just normal lifestyle like us, you would want to do no more than this. And just use portions, use a smaller bowl so that you, it will help you have accountability. Um, as far as the, the fruits, since I was talking about fruits prior, a half a cup of um, applesauce. This is again an apple. This is a fake apple, but this is my real apple. It's about, this is the serving size. And here's your pear. Same thing happens with the pears. Sometimes you get those giant pears. This is, this is a serving of fruit. A serving of cantaloupe. It's a little guy. It's a little, it's a little cantaloupe. It's not the big ones. And if you're having a dried fruit, it's typically two tablespoons of raisins, or it would be like three prunes would be a serving size. Um, so this we went over. This is, I did want to go through this really quick just to see, this is my diabetic teaching book and this is not a diabetic class so I don't really won't get into it. But I did highlight a couple of things that I thought would be interesting for you to know and that was the pasta being um, a third cup where people think it's a half cup but it's not. And the fact that spaghetti sauce, a half a cup of a spaghetti sauce is a carbohydrate serving, it does count. It is 80 calories. It's not a free food like a, a tomato would be. Um, the fruits, I did want to get, you do have this, and on the back it also tells you what a serving size is. This is for you to take home. This is wonderful. This is old. This is not the my plate. This is the old one, the pyramid before. But I like it so well I keep making a copy of it, as you can see by the poor quality. But you basically find your age group, your gender, your activity level. It tells you how many calories you should consume um, to maintain your weight. And then it goes into each food group and it tells you how many servings you should have in that food group to attain that calorie level. And down, then down here it tells you what a portion is in that food group. There is some discrepancy on this as opposed to the diabetic portions. Diabetic portions are more strict. These are more lenient, but roughly it's about the same. You know, we're not big on fruit juices. I'd rather you eat the whole fruit because there's a synergistic relationship in that food and you get the goodness and all the fiber and all that good pithiness, which if you have the fruit, you're just really putting sugar into your system in one big dump. You're not letting your, your body absorb it properly. So eight ounces of milk, six ounces of juice or four ounces of juice depending. Um, let me think. Dates are like the prunes we talked about. Raspberries are a cup. Remember I said the berries um, you can have more of and they're very healthful, great antioxidants. Uh, the fats, I did want to go over the fats real quick because a lot of people don't realize actually really what is in the fat group. There are as far as the meat goes, we definitely recommend you have the recommended portion of three ounces and it's not deep fried. There's no skin on it or, or excessive breading uh, and it's baked or boiled. So the fat, we talked about pecans being four halves is one fat serving. Almond is, almonds are six, six almonds. Peanuts are 10. So when we get back to those sleeves I talked about, you know you're getting a lot more than 10 peanuts in there. But 10 peanuts is a serving. Pistachios, you get to eat 16 of them. Uh, that's not bad. The oil is a teaspoon, teaspoon of oil. 
Pam is good. They have the olive oil on Pam now, and you can get a spritzer if you want. And you can just put oil in the it, it, in the spritzer and spritz it on yourself. Then you save yourself the the uh, the cost of the Pam spray. Mayonnaise, like I said, if it's reduced fat, it's a tablespoon. If it's not reduced fat, it's only a teaspoon. And I will say for mayo, uh, you can substitute non-fat Greek yogurt, which is you can mix it in, um, and that's a good like half and half. You can cut your calories down by using the non-fat Greek yogurt instead of mayo or with the mayo or the sour cream. It'll do the same thing. Sour cream or cream cheese. You could you, do, you could use a non-fat um, yogurt. Seeds are great. Seeds are great, but again, you're down to one tablespoon. So um, the flax seeds, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they're good, but don't don't go overboard with them. Uh, cream cheese is one and a half tablespoons if it's low fat, and sour cream. Reduced, you get, whoa, three tablespoons, that's good. Regularly, you get two, two teaspoons. So it's up to you which way you want to go. This you have already, not this particular format, but the information's in there. I just wanted to um, summarize this part by saying that a starch is a half a cup of cooked cereal or grain, a third cup of rice or pasta, that we talked about. One ounce of bread is like a slice of bread, basically. And three quarters to one ounce of crackers, it's typically about six saltines, roughly, or six triscuits, that type thing. And then as far as, of course, we recommend whole grains instead of white. You can even get the, we call the albino uh, wheat. You can get the white whole wheat that they have on the market now. I know that the health department, the moms that are on WIC for their kids, they can get the white whole wheat. But just make sure the first ingredient says whole wheat and not wheat flour. That's just a manufacturer's um, ploy to get you to think that it's not refined white flour. It is. Um, corn on the cob, that was a good one, and I don't have an example. But corn on the cob is only a three and a half to a four and a half ounce long. That's not very, that, if this is eight ounces, you're talking about this little baby. So if you eat a big corn on the cob, that's going to be two. Keep that in mind. And I know when it's in season, a lot of people just make corn on the cob their dinner. They just keep eating them because they're so good. So keep that in mind. Um, if you're eating chips, like a pita chip or a potato chip, it's actually about eight chips as a serving. So that's, a, that's, again, where you just take it out of the bag, put the bag aside, you have it there, you say, okay, I'm going to eat one of these slow, and I'm going to enjoy it, and then if I want something else, I, you know, have some flavored water, have an activity, go for a walk, take up crocheting, and you know, do something with your hands. A lot of people eat because they're bored or they want to do something with their hands. Don't go to smoking. Do something else with your hands. <laughs> Um, baked beans, it's a third cup actually. Those were the regular beans at a half a cup, but it's a third cup because of all the sugar. The reason people love baked beans is because they're sweet because they have a lot of sugar in them. And then this is one of my teaching tools for the diabetics. When I go, when I have a diabetes class, I normally utilize these, but for our purposes here, I just wanted to summarize with this one. And this is how to portion your plate. And this is based on the my plate, which is half fruit and vegetable, a quarter meat, and a quarter starch. And again, if you're still hungry, make yourself a giant salad and keep eating that or add some extra vegetables. You can never go wrong with adding extra vegetables. But this is, this is how you could divide your plate up. And then here's the pasta with a little bit of meat and your veggie sauce and your grapes. Grapes are about 16 grapes are a serving. They are little balls of sugar though, so keep that in mind. Um, apples are good, oranges are good, and uh, most of the uh, berries are wonderful. And then on the back again, how do you divide your plate up? 
Make sure when you have a sandwich, you're always putting lettuce or tomato on it. You have a fruit. And a pita bread, one whole pita bread is not a serving. It's typically two, depending on, unless you get the big ones. And then, of course, it's, it's, um, it could be a third of that or a half of that, depending how, how big your tortilla or your pita is. And the other, the, the first one I gave you of when you go to a restaurant, uh, like the burritos and the, the sandwiches and all, cut them in half. Just know you're getting excessive volume of food because that's what we're used to and that's what is being marketed and people feel happy when they have all that. But unfortunately, it's not good for your body. Uh, so, and then this one again, this last one, these are just some more examples. This looks very plentiful, like very jam-packed on these plates. They're using the smaller plate for this one. That's why it makes it look like you're getting a larger volume of food, which is great. Use a smaller plate and then you'll feel maybe more satisfied because you'll think that you're having abundance of food on your plate. You trick your eyes, you trick your stomach with your eyes. But again, you could see where it's the squash and the spinach with a little piece of chicken and a little sweet potato or whatever. And then this is mostly vegetables with a little bit of very thinly sliced chicken here. And the pizza you complement with salad. And it's, look at the size of the pizzas. They're cut very narrowly. So another trick with pizza is if you get it, get it with vegetables on it, not the meats. As you know, pepperoni pools oil. Um, and if you, any kind of pizza you get, you could put a uh, napkin on top and blot it. You could save a couple of teaspoons per slice of oil um, from the cheese, because cheese is very fatty. And it, you know, it, if you leave a cheese tray out after so many hours, there's little oil beads that develop on top of it. So just blot your pizza a little bit until just before the cheese starts to stick and you've saved yourself many calories um, from the oil. But that's basically all I have on portion control, unless you have any questions. That's in the, that's, oh, oh, zucchini, yeah, you can do that, do that, yeah. You can, zucchini falls into the category of 25 calories uh, serving and that's, I consider vegetables like a free food because they're so bulky, they have so much fiber, they fill you up. The pasta sauce that you put on top of that would be a half a cup of pasta sauce. It would be like eating a piece of bread, a carbohydrate. But yeah, it's a really good choice. Is the, and a lot of them have that spiral maker, the, the spiral thing that you can do with a, a scene on TV. Um, that would be a good choice too. And you can make lasagna with uh, zucchini, zucchini lasagna. Leave out the noodles, or you can make eggplant parmesan too and use eggplant instead of your pasta noodles. And it's delicious. Um, anything that has cheese on it is delicious. But just know it's a treat, and, it, and it's better. It's better than the other. So you could, because you're adding vegetables to your diet, you're making it taste really good. And you find that if you have that with, with a, um, a side vegetable and a big salad, you're very satisfied. So you can do all those. All right, then, if there's no other questions, I'll let Jenny take over and show us how to stretch and exercise. All right, so from one thing, we're supposed to exercise before we eat, but we're going to do it backwards today, right? Um, I'm going to pass out this handout. You just take one and pass it around. How many people in here actually exercise today? Like made a valiant effort to get up and do something besides just normal activity? Good, a few, good, good, good. Okay, so just like Charlene talked to you about, this isn't like automatic, you gotta work at it, right? You gotta think about it, you gotta plan your portions ahead. If you're gonna have a big meal out, you're maybe gonna eat a little bit less for breakfast and lunch, so you gotta think ahead, right? Same thing with exercise, it doesn't just happen. You gotta plan for it. And um, like they said earlier, I'm a physical therapist, I work with a lot of, see a lot of patients all day long, and I'll say, do you, do you exercise? And they say, oh, I walk a lot at work, or I'm a nurse, I'm on the, you know, I walk the floor, I, I'm doing a lot of exercise, and you may, you may, I mean, certainly there are some jobs that are more active or more sedentary than others, but the bottom line is we know that your work exercise doesn't count. I mean, it's helpful, but you need to take some time most days of the week and set aside for exercise. 
So the recommended um, aerobic exercise, meaning walking, biking, swimming, jogging, something where you're engaged for 10 to 30 minutes, getting your heart rate up a little bit, that recommended amount is 150 minutes a week, which if you spread it over five days, that's 30 minutes a day. Um, we know it doesn't, it doesn't have to be 30 minutes all at once. It can be five to 10 minute bursts of walking, um, where you, again, where your heart rate's a little elevated, you may be a little bit out of breath. So that's the aerobic part. And what I'm gonna talk about tonight is some flexibility and strengthening, because we need to keep our muscles strong and also flexible. So if you can, I'd like you to stand up and we're just gonna go through this list. And these are just some guidelines, some recommendations. If you're unable to stand, you can do most of these sitting. So if you feel more comfortable sitting, you certainly can have a seat. If your balance is a little bit challenged, then I would recommend you have a chair in front of you or stand by your counter to do these. But certainly, you can do them all standing. So the first one is simply march in place. So one foot up and then the other. How long do you do this for? Well, how much time do you have? If you've only got five minutes, maybe you do everything on this sheet, 10 or 15 repetitions. The other thing is, you'll notice if you march just for a minute, you're gonna get tired. Your legs are gonna start to feel heavy. You might get a little out of breath. So this isn't rocket science, right? Everyone can do this. Okay, we'll do about five more. So one, two, three, four, five. Okay, and you could certainly, if you have longer time, you could do it for longer. All right, what about side stopping? So if you try to give yourself a little bit of room next to your neighbor, and you're just going to step right leg out, bring it back, left leg out, bring it back. So back and forth, right and left. Yep back and forth. So do one leg and then the other. Those of you that know how to dance, this is probably some kind of start of a dance move. I am not a dancer. If you are a dancer, it's a great exercise. And if you feel like your balance is a little challenged, you can hang on to a chair. Okay, now you're gonna step forward. So take your right leg forward, take it back behind you if you have room. Take it forward, take it back. I'm sure these are dance moves, right? Is anybody in here a dancer? I used to be. Cha cha cha. Yeah, there you go. And you can do arm movements if you want to. When you get more balance, you could certainly swing your arms into it. Okay, we'll come back to center. Now your left leg's going forward. So forward and back. If any of you have ever done any like the walk a mile videos, or tapes that you used to have, like cassette and CDs that you could listen to and they would be walk a mile, they would have you do these kind of things for 15 or 20 minutes. And they say that's equivalent to a walking a mile. Okay, we'll do a couple more. Is anyone wearing a uh, step counter? Yours might start beeping at you because it's gonna tell you that you're moving. <laughs> Okay, back to center. Next thing on there is squatting. So I tell a lot of my patients, squats are one of the, the best things for you because when you can't squat, you're not living alone anymore. Because every time you get up and out of a chair, that's a squat. So when you're not able to get yourself on and off the toilet or on and out of the chair, that's when you're gonna need some help at home, right? So squatting is a fine thing to do. A lot of people think it's bad for your knees and it can be bad for your knees I don't know if we're to be so you guys can see me. I'll show this side first. So with squatting, when your knees go above your, in front of your toes and my heels come up, that's bad. You want your butt back like you're sitting in a chair, weight on your heels. I'll show this side if you can see me. So not good is this, when your heels come up and my weight's forward. Good is weight on the heels like I'm sitting in a chair. That makes sense? So a lot of times I will put my hands out in front of me to balance me. So do some squats. And you don't have to go deep, okay? Weight back in your heels. My heels are staying down. How deep is my squat? What's comfortable? If I feel like I can't get back up, I'm not going that far. If I feel like I need help, I have my hands on a chair in front of me or at the counter. If I'm, really, if I'm not able to do that at all, I sit in my chair and I come up a little bit with the use of my hands and I go back down. 
and I come up and I go down. But always in control, never plopping down, okay? That's using momentum. So if I'm not able to squat standing, I can sit and go up and down and use my hands until I get stronger. Questions about squats? So they're okay to do. Remember, my weight's back. That's what you have to remember with squats. My weight is not forward. <laughs> Stick your butt out, yeah. Okay, heel and toe raises. So I'm standing tall. I'm hanging on for balance if I need it. I'm up on my toes. I'm down and my toes come up. So I'm going up on my toes. My heels are up. I'm coming back now and my toes are up. Back and forth. As we age, we rarely run, we rarely jump. We're not doing jumping jacks, so our calf muscles can get quite weak because we're not using that, those muscles as much. But also as we age, our balance tends to go south, again, because we're not using it, and our ankle mobility is really important in preventing falls. So heel and toe, and you can hang on to something in front of you if you need to. My knees should be st straight. Sometimes if people are weak, their knees will want to bend and they'll try to pick up their heels. Keep your knees straight. The other thing you want to remember with this is you're not doing the hula hoop. I'm not moving my whole body. I'm relatively going up and my center of gravity is relatively center, straight. I'm not sticking my butt out. Does that make sense? So you should feel the motion or the work in your calves and in your shin muscles. Okay. Arm raises overhead. Bring your hands here, just go up and down. You could put weights in your hands. You could put a can of soup. I've got some um, exercise bands to do in a minute. And then I can combine these with my steps, right? I could step forward and back as I go up and down. So you can combine those. If you're not using your arms a lot overhead, again, that can get hard to do, okay? I can go sideways, raise my arms out sideways, up and down. And I can add my steps to this. I could step sideways and out, left to right. So you can combine these movements for a more aerobic workout where you get your heart rate up. I can push my arms out in front of me, out and back, out and back. And again, I could use light weights. If you don't have weights, you can use like soup cans. I have a pair of just um, wrist weights, so they're almost like an ankle, but they're made for the wrist. They're just a couple pounds that I'll put on my hands sometimes and either walk with them or just do these light things. People that have, if you have trouble with your hands with arthritis, just gripping, closing and opening, closing, opening. Stretching those hands as wide as you can. Especially if, we, if your job requires a lot of gripping or repetitive gripping tasks, don't forget to open them too and get that stretched out. Okay, all right, I'm gonna pass out some exercise bands. We'll do a couple exercises. Is anyone here allergic to latex? No? Okay, these are all latex free because I wasn't sure, so take one and pass it around. And then I have my non-latex, or my latex pile, <laughs> which I have to cut. Becky, if you wanna hold on to the end of that. Mm -hmm. Let's cut you a piece and then I'll have you hang on to that. Okay, pass it in. We should, did I get enough? Hopefully I have enough. You need two more. Oh shoot, I'm out, so share if you can. Oh, okay. I would say you just have it. Yeah, you don't want to do resistance yet. Okay, so arms out in front of you. You might want to turn so you don't hit your neighbor. And you can still do these without a band if you're, okay? And you're gonna pull your arms apart. So hands at shoulder level, you're gonna pull apart. Really good for our chest muscles, opening that up. A lot of us, I mean, our jobs aren't back here. They're all forward, so we tend to be forward all day long. This is a good one to open the chest muscles up and work our scapular or postural muscles. If it's too hard, if you're like, I can hardly move this, give yourself some slack in the beginning. If it's too easy, get your hands closer together. Don't hurt people, don't hurt your neighbor. I'm gonna grab this from you. Okay, now put it around your back like this. Hang on to the ends and you're gonna pull forward. 
And again, you want to make sure my body's steady. I'm not going with it. I'm holding my body steady and just my arms are moving. And you've incorporated your core. Everyone likes to work their core, right? I'm not holding my breath to work my core. Just by not moving my body, just my arms, I'm working my core. Okay, now turn and face your neighbor. Let go of the band. I'll be your neighbor. You're going to hold the middle. Of the, your neighbor's going to hold the middle of your band. You're on both ends, and you're pulling back like you're rowing a boat. Now your neighbor's going to get a workout too, because they're going to they're going to have to prevent it from pulling you know pulling you forward with me, right? right. So you're getting a workout too in your stomach and back muscles. <laughs> so do 10 or 15, and then switch. If you don't have a neighbor at home, doorknobs work good to put tie those around. Or if you have a if in your basement you have those poles, you know that something like that. <laughs> Try to hold your upper body steady and just move your arms. There you go. And if you haven't switched, go ahead and switch, and the other person holds the center. And you're going to pull back. I've got my body steady. My whole body's not going with it, just the arms. Go ahead. And if you don't, I'm, I'm a huge, I, I rarely count. I, I lose track. Um, my thoughts are somewhere else. So you want to do enough to feel like you're tired, you got a little bit of a workout. And then do a few more and call it good. Good. So that's some stuff. You can do lots of stuff with bands. You can put it around your legs and you could kick sideways with it too. There's lots of different things you can do. The nice thing about the bands versus a weight is they, they're lightweight, right? They travel everywhere. If you're someone who travels a lot, you throw them in your suitcase, they're easily accessible. Um, and they're not heavy, they don't take up much space. So that's the nice thing about the bands. Um, and you can take those home with you. Does anyone ever in here do push-ups? The wall kind. The wall kind, okay. <laughs> so we'll practice around. Um, this is how you can do, if you can't do push-ups, um, you can do wall push-ups. My hands are at shoulder level. I'm coming down, I'm coming back up. I'm not, I'm not, I'm keeping my back straight. I'm not arching my back, that sort of thing. My back is straight and the motion's coming from my shoulders. All right, so if you've got room, grab a wall. There's a couple spaces up here. Hands are at shoulder level. I lean into the wall. Yep, go ahead and go down. Keep your hands against the wall. Your hands flat. Yes. Heels stay down. Your heels stay down. Don't arch your back. And just come back. Your, when you come back, your hands should not leave the wall. They should stay there. Elbows should be straight when you come back. Yeah. Of push-ups? Oh my gosh. If I can do 10, I'm happy. I, I, I'm not a good push. So, you know, you don't have to be on the floor doing push -ups. You can start with that. You could go to one arm. You know, you could do that kind of stuff. Planks are really advanced. Does anyone in here do planks? <laughs> Only when we don't call the ball volleyball. Okay. So, if you're looking for something more challenging, planks, you can do planks. So, that's when you're on the ground and you would either have your forearms down like this or arms extended feet behind you, kind of like a table, um, looking like a table, and you would hold that for anywhere from 10 seconds. Or, again, on, you could go on YouTube and probably find people who hold it for hours. Um, who are, but if you do, if you do planks, um, or if you haven't, you should try them if you can get up and down off the floor, because they're another one of those, a lot of bang for your buck. You could spend a minute doing them, like do you know, six or seven reps for 10 or 15 seconds, and you will feel your arms will be shaking, your stomach and back will be shaking, your legs, I mean, you can get a lot of bang for your buck with just a little input. And that would be a strengthening exercise. So planks, if you can do them, are um, one of those um, easily accessible exercises that you don't need any fancy equipment for. 
In addition, we talked about that you could put ankle weights on your um, legs to do the leg, the side stepping or the marching. Um, I don't recommend, I get this question a lot, I don't recommend wearing ankle weights when you walk um, because the force is through your joints. So they're okay to wear to do side kicks or marching, but to walk with ankle weights on, I wouldn't recommend it because we know that's more force through your joint. That's why I recommend that you're a healthy weight to do weight bearing activities because the heavier you are when you walk, there's more force through your knees and through your hips. So why would you add weight to your leg? Does that make sense? When you're walking, fine for the arms because they're not bearing weight when I'm lifting, when I'm doing my arm exercises. But when I'm walking, that force is going through my hip, knee, and ankle joints. So I don't recommend that for walking. Um, but it's fine for the arms. What about walking with the line of wrist? Fine, because I'm not putting weight through my wrist as I walk like I am my ankle. So that's fine. Um, you guys can have a seat down if you want. What, um, that's, so that's just a quick, what can I do? I don't have any fancy equipment. You don't need fancy equipment. I get that question a lot. What kind of equipment should I buy? If you hate treadmills, don't buy a treadmill because you're never going to use it. Um, <laughs> yes, they become a clothes closet for people or a clothes rack, and we've all seen it. Um, so do you need a piece of aerobic equipment like a treadmill or a bike? And well, if you can't get outside and walk or ride your bike or you're not going to do an exercise class, like a swimming class or something, that may be an option to look into. Um, but if you don't like treadmills or you don't like stationary bikes and you're not going to use it, don't buy one. But this is a list of a quick, you know, you can make this as long of a workout as you want or as short of a workout as you want. And it gets your flex some flexibility, some strength, and your balance as well. Um, and that would be, those would be in addition to trying to get that 150 minutes a week of aerobic exercise. So that's what I have to show you to some ideas to think about for exercise. What kind of questions do you guys have, if any? You all ready to go work out? <laughs> yeah. Does anyone have, uh, does anyone own any exercise equipment that they use on a regular basis? Pat, what do you use? Okay. Like the ones that you just pick up and put in front of your chair, like that type of thing, or an actual... It's got the one wheel in the front. Oh, okay. Actually, like an air diner or something like yes, that. It doesn't take up a lot of space. Uh-huh. You can get 13 commercials. You can get 15 That's a great idea, idea for that. Yeah. Um, aerobic versus anaerobic. Um, they're both equally important, but I did read something where aerobic More so than aerobic. Than aerobic. Have you I have not seen that. Yeah. Just that exercise in general, it, um, exercise in general is good for helping to prevent dementia. All the, you, you can't go wrong. No one's going to tell you to sit in a chair. I mean, we just don't prescribe that anymore. I mean, occasionally I'll have patients come to me and say, oh, the doctor said I, I shouldn't move. I'm like, what? You know? And then that can create a whole nother. Um, all in moderation. Yes, all in moderation. Unless you have an active blood clot that you was just diagnosed within the last 24 to 48 hours or you have a broken bone there is really is or open heart surgery but you're still moving right yeah i mean you're you have some precautions you're not supposed to lift heavy weights you're probably supposed to move your arms overhead for so many weeks but i'm sure the doctor i'm sure the doctor told you to, to walk oh yes that sort of thing so my dad had his surgery they had him out in the hospital in 48 hours and yeah so exercising so your best um um, defense against any disease what, um, is exercise and what Charlene talked about your you know your grocery cart your grocery cart is your medicine and what you put in it is your choice no one can make that choice but you um, so these two things I mean any of your doctors are going to tell you that's the key to staying healthy and if you have a chronic disease helping to fight it so it doesn't get any worse but I have to look that up the anaerobic versus the aerobic I wonder what kind of do you know what they did for anaerobic exercise it's just but did, did, did they, they, you, not, they do a... Not to neglect the one right. or the other. Do both. Right. Right. So the aerobic is exercise is when you're like huffing and puffing for that 30 minutes where anaerobic is you're doing more strength training. Um, but equally important. We know strength training, especially for us women, we're at risk for osteoporosis. Um, and, to prevent, and we know with the hormonal changes we have during menopause, our risk for osteoporosis increases. So that's where weight-bearing exercises, walking, um, and then lifting some weights. It doesn't have to be heavy. We know light weights, 10 to 15 reps, a couple sets um, a day, a few times a week is really enough. It doesn't have to be, you don't need to be at the gym, power lifting and get your name on the wall. You don't need, I mean, you can if you want, 
but you don't have to go that far. So don't let those types of things scare you away. Any other questions? All right, that's a wrap then. Go forth and be healthy, right? <laughs> <laughs>